Peggy Fair, and welcome to the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Nancy Elwood is my guest today, and she's going to talk about birds in flight. The Understand Photography Show is a podcast, but we also put it on YouTube and on Facebook, so you can watch the behind-the-scenes video. Um, if you are watching the behind-the-scenes video and wonder why we don't have any visual aid, that's why, because most of our audience listens to us while they're driving to work, taking their walk, they're listening to us on, as a podcast. <laughs> and we are available pretty much everywhere podcasts are played. Our website is understandphotography.com. Check it out. You know, you can click on freebies and you'll join us on our, our mailing list. And plus you get something free. You can choose what you like. But also we have a lot. I mean, I, I work hard on that website. So we've got hundreds of blog articles, all of our videos are on our website. So all of the shows, the Understand Photography shows with the videos and the show notes, they're all you know, nicely organized in one spot on our website. All of our how-to videos, for a while we were doing short videos every Tuesday, which got to be too much work. <laughs> but they're all you know, with the notes right in the website. So you can learn so much. Our motto at Understand Photography is we simplify the technical. Now, I've been following Nancy Elwood for quite a while on Facebook. She's really good at Facebook. She puts some amazing pictures. And she just specializes in birds in flight. Birds in flight is really hard. So we're going to talk. It's a little bit, it's a little bit technical, but I think you guys can probably keep up. We try to keep it simple, you know, but it is a little bit technical to photograph birds in flight. So if that's something that is really interesting to you, you will like this show. So welcome, Nancy. Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Peggy, for inviting me for this interview. Well, thanks for being on the Understand Photography Show. Okay, so Nancy, tell our audience a little bit about you. Well, I'm rather self-taught. Um, I grew up a lot in Florida, having been born in Massachusetts, but I was born and raised and went to university in Florida, Florida State specifically. And um, I started traveling early on. Traveling was sort of my passion, and I got introduced to many of the National Geographic photographers along the way traveling to Antarctica and Kenya and Botswana, Zaire and Madagascar. And uh, so that just pressed me on with my photography. And I just kept, um, like I say, mostly self self taught from my photography point of view and uh, traveling. And uh, I ended up uh, wandering outside of Florida for a while. And then coming back in 04, and ever since 2004, I've been uh, working on my photography, traveling. I do photography workshops, both in the United States and abroad, um, private workshops and group workshops, and uh, did a few art shows for a while. And um, now I'm retired and retired from my other profession, which was a nurse anesthetist for many years. Um, so now I can plunge forward full time into my photography. That's so, awesome. And you are an awesome photographer. I've been following you for a long time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Now today we're going to talk about birds in flight. You know, bird photography, people are really into birds. And I mean, birds are so cool. But birds in flight, that's a tough, that's hard. It is, and it's probably the one thing that my clients want to start off with, <laughs> uh, which sometimes, depending on where they are in their um, learning process, I kind of have to step them back a uh, step and say, well, let's work on the, um, uh, the, the, the non-moving objects first, and then we'll work into the moving <laughs> objects. Um, but yes, very difficult because obviously um, we can't tell them when to move or how to move or which direction to move. And also what takes into account is the learning of the subject matter. Uh, what are their patterns of moving? And also from a photographer's point of view or a human point of view, I always like to teach how to be aware of your subjects being aware of you. You would like them to have 
you have yourself blend into their world. So uh, the biggest thing is learning about the subject, being aware of how they look. If they're aware of you, you're too close, that, and then you won't get a natural behavior. And so I, I think that's most important. I, I think from overall perspectiveness of, for our um, wildlife in general. Um, so um, that's the main thing I hear bird photographers say in general is you, you have to know the behavior. You have to know, I mean, like specifically, like say we say a reddish egret has a certain fishing pattern they have. They run, 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 and then they put up their feathers to look because they hide the reflection in the water so they can see the fish better, run, 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 and do the same. So once they do that, if you're aware of that, that will help you in your following them and understanding their concept and filling the frame and understanding their wings going up and such like that. And owls, owls will have a certain behavior. And if they're um, aware of you and that, they'll start with their bobbing of their heads around and, and then maybe you have to just sit, be quiet, step back and, and uh, let them be quiet for a while, things like that. But that all helps, but birds in flight and stuff, Yes, um, I, I think it's an achievement every wildlife photographer wants to accomplish, uh, and it just takes a lot of practice. Yeah, so, so let's just talk about the technical side of taking pictures of birds in flight, because the behavior, of course, is the most important, because if you know when they're about to take off, you're going to have a much better chance of getting a good bird in flight shot, right? <laughs> It is, and looking at equipment, uh, uh, a lot of, um, depending on what camera, if you've already got a camera or body system you're working with, or you're just starting out, things to consider are how many focus points does this cap camera have? Um, some of the beginning cameras can only have like 51 focus points or 32 focus points. Um, this is coming from either Olympus or Fuji or Sony. And then as you work out, because people say to me, well, you spent so much money for this body. Uh, and I says, yes, but this is what comes with that. Um, and comes with it usually is more focus points, which gives you more ability to have that camera help you in capturing that moving object. Uh, the other thing is the lenses you choose. Um, you have zoom lenses, and our zoom lenses have been very, um, over the years, have become very good um, and much better than in the past. Uh, but uh, I tend to favor my prime lenses. Mm. Uh, they tend to react a little better. Um, autofocus speed. Um, so you've got to take that into consideration. Also, the aperture of that lens. Uh, for example, the difference, you can have a camera body that has like, I'm going to take, for example, the new Nikon bodies that have 151 focus points. Well, there are certain focus points that are called cross-hatched focus points, which means not only do they help you in capturing the action in one direction, but it helps you in both directions, the vertical and the perpendicular. So therefore, the more active these cross-hatched focus points are, the easier, well, the, the easier the camera will to help you in focusing in a moving subject. Mm -hmm. And so the cameras, the lenses you pick for your camera body can actually influence how many active cross-hatched focus points there are. For example, with I have a uh, the new 500 Nikon F4 E FL model. Well, that model attached to the newer Nikons not only give me crop give me multiple cross-hatched focus points in the middle, but it also gives me side a, a row on each side of cross-hatched focus points. Now, I also have the miniature 500 5.6 PF, which is a dream lens, and it's obviously much lighter than the F4. It's wonderful, but because the aperture, the furthest it can open to is 5.6, it 
it only has a cross hatched in the middle. Doesn't give me any bars on the side. Uh -huh. Also, the other thing is if you put a TC on a lens, I, I tend to advise people, especially with the zoom lenses, not to attach a TC. What's a TC? To a teleconverter. Thank you. <laughs> and you can get them in versions. Usually they come in the 1.4 or the 2 versions. And you, tell, you tell people not to put them on? Not to put them on zoom lenses. Oh, oh, oh. Except only certain zoom lenses. Like uh, one of the more, like for example, the two popular zooms uh, in the Canon and the um, Nikon. The Nikon has a very popular zoom. It's the 200, 500, 5.6. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, if you put a teleconverter on that, let's say the 1.4, that becomes an F8 lens, which yeah. means it's the opening becomes that much smaller, which means it's less, less, less light in which means that doesn't help your autofocus at all. In fact, it, it's terrible. <laughs> really slows your autofocus down. And of course, it takes away those cross-hatched focus points along with it. Okay. So there's certain, tel uh, certain zooms uh, I use a uh, teleconverter on, uh, the 70 to 200, either the 2.8 or the F4. Those are two lenses you can use teleconverters on to not too much of a detriment of quality. But prime lenses, you see, is where the teleconverter becomes uh, much more applicable. Okay. Um, so you just have to be aware. Those are the things in choosing lenses and people say, you know, how much this lens is and this costs a lot of money. You kind of get what you... I have to say with lenses, you get what you pay for, unfortunately. Uh, in glass, um, you end up getting what you pay for. So I, I tend to tell people, invest in the, if you're really into it, invest in the glass more maybe so than the camera body. That's exactly what I say. Start off with that, because the glass you'll, you'll always, that'll always stay with you. I mean, Plus, glass. plus the lenses have a pretty decent resale value where your camera is like driving a car off the lot. Your camera goes down in value right away, but your lens keeps the value. Exactly. I bought a used, before the VR feature came out on the Nikon 500, I bought an AFS model from a friend of mine. And I bought it for $5,000. This is back in 2000, um, well, eight. 2007. Anyway, when it came time when I was selling it, after the new FL lighter version 500 came out, mm -hmm. I was able to sell it for only 200 less than what I paid for. That's awesome. So um, that sometimes, so I'd, I had used it for a good seven years and only it only cost me $200. I have a, now, my story is not as good as yours, but I bought my 24, or my 70 to 200 2.8 in 2001. I sold it in 2016. So I bought it because it was more expensive back then. I bought it for about, right about, I don't know, it was like $2,100, I think. And I sold it for 1200 But I used it for, what, 15 years? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I was thrilled with $1,200 for that lens. Exactly. So those are the things to think about. And a lot of it is knowing your tools. You know, I tell people, okay, I mean, I understand people just can't go out and buy the latest and greatest, but the biggest thing is learning the, the tool you have and using it to the best of your ability. Then when you do go to get others, you, you understand why you're upgrading and you have a more knowledge base of how to upgrade to and why. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, now, what what uh, what camera mode do you shoot in? Do you shoot in aperture priority or manual or shutter? I'm priority? very much an aperture priority person. Okay. Um, my main thing is when I tell people is the main thing is you understand what all those settings are. Understand what aperture means. Understand what the ISO means. I am, uh, the shutter speed is pretty, pretty self-explanatory, but understand how all those three things work together. And if you do that, 
And the mode you choose is really, I mean, people say, if you don't shoot in manual, then you're, I said, you know, if you understand and you're getting the results you want, that, that that's really the main thing. But well, my, here, my, here's my belief. And I, I have a very, you know, my most popular class is called the four weeks to proficiency in photography, because if you don't understand, like you said, if you don't understand how to shoot in the manual mode, you could shoot an aperture priority, but you, you're in danger of having blurry pictures if you don't understand that you've got to watch that shutter speed. Right, uh, which is what I geared, the, the aperture, how to pick the aperture. And then mo most people do not shoot at, at, at a high enough shutter speed. I would say 99% of the people that are not getting good results are because of the shutter speed. And the main thing they don't, well, well I don't want to go up on the ISO. I says, yeah, but you're throwing your pictures away anyway. So whether you go up on the ISO or not, you're not getting good pictures. So my thing is I, I pick the aperture depending on the subject mm -hmm. I'm doing and the time of day. And then I adjust my ISO to the shutter speed I need. So I try to set people up with their cameras so they can do all of this as they're looking through the camera. So with the Nikon, they have a setting called easy exposure compensation, which I have on. So which means when I set up my ex uh, aperture for that particular time of day and that particular event, then depending on what I need for shutter speed. Now, if the subject is standing right there, are you on a tripod? Are you hand holding? Are you on a boat? That will all determine how well do you hand hold? Are you well, are you well versed in it? Have you practiced it? Are you able to get that? How many, how many megapixels is your camera? For like the D850 and some of the new Sonys that are like 46 megapixels, 60 megapixels, you're gonna need more shutter speed because those babies pick out every little flaw that you have. So like with my D850, I always have to push a little more shutter speed in to get that sharpness, even if it's a steady subject and I'm on a tripod. I still have to work that in. But so the shutter speed is determined. So I always say, let's say you have a bird sitting in the tree or on a nest, let's say, and you set up you, it's, uh, let's say you have an f6.3, you feel you can get all those that subject in focus there again, and the idea of the background, um, that, that the brocade that we're all talking about, um, the 6.3 might be fine, but depending on, are you at an angle? So the 6.3, if you're focused on the body, the face isn't not gonna be in the plane of focus. But if you're level with the subject or rel relatively level, you might get away with the f5.6 or 6.3, depending on the light that you need. And then depending on, like I said, your hand holding or you're on a tripod or you're on a boat. So you have to take in the movement of the boat. Also, if it's a windy day, you have to take an effect that the feathers might be moving around. So how's that? feature into your shutter speed. So then you just pick the ISO that's going to do your um, your shutter speed appropriately. Now the other thing is what I teach, especially because we're all this ISO and noise used to be grain in the old in the old film days. I teach to expose to the right, mm -hmm. which means you don't want to have that subject that when you take it into post-process, you're trying to bring out the shadows. You will inevitably bring out the noise, period. So I, as I use my exposure compensation to move that histogram. I have them set up with the histogram so you can take a test shot and look at your histogram. Also look at the subject. If you say, boy, that's dark. I'm going to have to bring out shadows. Well, then you don't have enough exposure compensation in. You dial in that exposure compensation. Is your subject against a dark, against a light background? Also, I tend to use the 
uh, Nikon's matrix metering. Now that's equivalent to the Canon's evaluative metering and Olympus has a, another name for it. Multi. It all, all means is that it prioritizes your center of what you're focusing on, but it also helps you with the background. It's not spot metering. I, I rarely use spot metering because actually the spot metering doesn't come out of the center. You, you can't move that around. Center weight you can, but I, I don't. I, I like matrix metering, so that's what I use. So if I've got a dark bird against a light background, it's going to take in that light background and might say, "Well, I need to close the exposure down some because that's a bright background." Whereas your subject will be too dark. That's why you have to expose for your subjects. Don't expose for the background. Expose for your subject. So I might have a hawk the sky background, but I might have to put in like a plus 2.3 exposure comp to get the hawk exposed properly. Now, when the exposure compensation happens, does it take it, uh, where, where does it take it from, ISO? Nope, your own exposure compensation button. I know, but it's got to be, um, the light's got to be coming. Uh, sometimes from. it can take it from the shutter speed, so you do have to be careful of okay. that. Be aware of that. Um, uh, to be honest with you, I, I'm not sure exactly. And okay. every camera seems to have their own method of dealing with that. Okay. So the ISO never changes with that. Um, so uh, I don't. I, we'll have to we'll have to check it out. Try it and see. A lot of it is testing. Yeah. Where you are when you come to a, you know first part of the day depending on what the light is, it is right at dawn. Uh, you have a certain lighting situation that you test. So I usually take a test shot of some greenery that's dark, like the subject might be. So I see how the greenery is, is it rightly exposed? So when I come upon the subject, I'll already kind of be, have an idea of what right. Right. Yeah, that's that's the way, it, well, Joe mostly does the, our bird photography, but that's exactly what, He's like, well, you know, it's going to be around that, that the lighting is the same you there. It as, as a tool of your camera and knowing your sensor of your camera. That's why I recommend also to take your tool out, even on a rotten day at home, not on a special trip, and test out your camera. Take these shots, take them home, and process them. Learn how much you can get out of that camera. So when you're on a special trip and that, you know exactly how much you can get out of it in those special searches situations. Like for now, example, I was in Brazil and we went to a blind in the Pantanal that had a ocelot that would come, maybe. We were fortunate it came three out of the four times, but they, no flash was allowed and they had sort of lights that sort of kind of mimicked moonlight, but that was all. So I had my D850 and I had the 70 to 200 F4 and I put it on F4 and I had to wait for the ocelot to be still because I didn't have any room for shutter speed. And I put it up against, they had a little bar, a wooden uh, thing that I could put my camera on. But I had the ISO up to 10,000 and 12,800 and they turned out they just, so those are the situations you want to be confident of your equipment, but get all that done at home. Yeah. So you get that done and trash them, you don't feel bad about it. You need to really understand photography, right? Yes. And then you need to understand your gear. I have a couple questions though about what we just talked about. So why, why wouldn't you just shoot in manual with your ISO and automatic. That way you can change, you know, you can make sure you're shutting. I don't use auto ISO because I find it tends to, uh, it, um, it plays, uh, I try to like to have the ISO really as low as I it can be tolerable. I, I, the camera doesn't know what I need. Do I need the shutter speed? Or, or, or do I need this? I don't know. I, 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 to me, 
Um, the manual, the only thing is with the manual, I feel you somewhat, and some people, they're very used to doing it that way, but you do have to decide in your exposure comp, what, what are you gonna take away then in manual? Are you gonna take away shutter speed, take away aperture, take away, I, I, and you need to know in which direction and what are you gonna decrease? I, I'm just trying to decrease my thought process. So I, I have the aperture I want, uh, period, and the ISO and the shutter speed. So when I need to do the exposure comp, I'm not having to think, oh, well, now I have to decrease my shutter speed because I have to increase the exposure or I have to, anyway. I, I, I but just you don't if you're using ISO, auto, auto ISO. No, but I, I have it, found- It does all the thinking for you. But I'm just it. thinking because you need a fast shutter speed and of course you sometimes, want. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes uh, I put it down. See, that's what I'm saying. Like, say you come upon a stationary subject. Well, I try to get the shutter speed down as low as I possibly can relative to low ISO, um, depending if I'm hand holding or whatever. And I get yeah, a few shots so in. So, how do you change the shutter speed if you're shooting an aperture priority? The ISO. Okay, so you're changing something anyway. It just yeah, but the eyes yeah with one thing. I, I don't have any sub. I, I don't have any. I don't have to think about changing the aperture. I already have a known, known product, known factor. I don't want to change that aperture. So the only thing I can change to change the shutter speed is the ISO. Okay, so my my second question about what we just talked about was um, you said you like matrix metering, the, which is the overall metering. So it's the most important importance goes on your focus point, but then it kind of gives averages out. Now, if you're doing a white bird on a black, on a dark background, isn't your bird going to overexpose using a matrix metering? Well, that's where you expose your comp comes in. But if, you use, is, but if you use spot metering, you wouldn't have to do that, right? At the spot metering is stationary on the Nikon, so you, I can't change that spot metering. It, it, it goes with the focus oh, point. Oh, point. Uh, limited, so not so much so. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, the other thing is, I, I a lot of times the birds I'm shooting come from a dark background to light background. Yeah, they're always the backgrounds are moving. So sometimes I have to compromise with the settings. So I set up an ISO, like I had an owl coming out of the tree, dark in the tree. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden it's in a bright sky. Mm -hmm. now, I can't change things automatically as it comes out of a tree and that. So what I do is I set up a, a shutter speed that I know is going to give me proper for that setting with the owl but it might give me like 5,000 shutter speed when it ends up in the sky, but I, I don't care because I don't have to change anything. It's a compromise. So I set up an ISO that'll work and an exposure that'll work both in the trees and in the sky. Okay, so um, let's talk about the autofocusing because you, t you talked about all the different points and you know the the better cameras have more focus points right. for bird photo for bird photography, right? Correct. So, um, so how I always use autofocus C, which is the continuous. So that's you know, okay. The shutters you, you're halfway down, and it just keeps. Now, normally, as the bird moves or the subject moves, I use a bumping technique. So I'll take my finger off of the shutter and put it back on the shutter halfway to re-engage the autofocus. Okay. Sometimes it gets a little lazy and of course the subject's moving. So a lot of people use a bumping technique. So they kind of re-engage the shutter to, to re-engage the autofocus. Okay, so you're in, in uh, AFC. AFC on a Nikon or Sony and it's called um, AI yeah, they're all AI uh, Turbo on a on a Canon. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I lost yeah. it for a minute. <laughs> AI yeah. Turbo on a Canon. So what that focus mode is doing is is continuously focusing, right? Correct. Correct. But you're talking about bumping where you're gonna 
Sure. Because so just to make sure bird, it keeps coming towards you. And the worst kind of thing to get out of focus on is something coming towards you. Exactly. <laughs> so you, you kind of practice re-engaging that. So I try to take the shutter off, take my finger off the shutter, put it back, re-engaging, off, re-engaging as the subject comes. Now, how do the all these focus points work? You know, well, I know on, on like different cameras, you know, especially the birding cameras, you know, they've got zones and all kinds of stuff. Can yes, you, can and, you and that? Canon has a lot of zones, much more so than the Nikons. The Canons tend to have a lot of zone type. I don't do all that. Um, I, I have a, a choice of single, a single point. I have a 9, 25, 72, and 151. I usually do the 25 point. Now everybody's got to work with their tool. I tend to never, hardly ever do 72 or 151. It just gives your autofocus system a whole lot to work with. And with a busy background or whatever, it, I, I don't think it will help you. Right, uh, I might catch I, on I, something. Correct. The other thing is, of course, those adjustments you do for autofocus tracking, which means you adjust the tracking mechanism. Will it, when the autofocus comes off the subject, is it going to re-engage the subject right away? How long does it take to come off the subject and re-engage to another position? Those are all adjustments within each camera model, too. Uh, I tend to keep it all in the middle. I'm very unfancy about this stuff. Um, unless I'm in a particular situation that I might be around maybe hummingbirds that I know are very dart around a lot or such, I tend to keep all those in the middle. Because um, when you start trying to adjust things to this and just things that you all end up in the field and you end up saying, ugh, and I forgot to adjust this or I forgot to readjust that. And I think people get confused with that and you have so many settings going on that you'll miss a shot. So, so what, what t t talk about autofocus tracking. Well autofocus tracking um, has to do with how fast the autofocus once it's locked on how how long will that that focus stay on that subject and then re-engage when it's off of it. Let's say the bird flies behind a tree. So you have your autofocus and it's locked on the subject and you're following it and it goes behind a tree. Now, if you had it on so it would come off and re-engage quickly, you'd go from the subject and go on the tree right away. As opposed to maybe if you had it a bit longer, it would stay on the subject, you follow up behind the tree and it would still have been on the subject. It wouldn't re-engage on the tree. Is that a setting within your camera that you can It get? is. Yeah. And it, it's a menu item? It, it is a menu item. And so um, it's... It is... Um, yeah, because you're in a world I'm not... I'm not a bird photographer. Yeah, it's so block or. shot autofocus response, which is what I was talking about, and the subject motion steady or erratic. Those are the two things that are on the Nikon that, and in both my 850 and D500 and D850, it's under the um, uh, autofocus A3 menu. And what do Those you, the, what, what do you prefer again? I keep them in the middle. I don't get fancy with these settings. Okay. <laughs> I just see, I just find a lot of this I understand the camera might help you with some of these settings, but a lot of it is practicing your technique of panning, to be honest. Um, so, you know, I tell people go out to the beach, or go to a pond that has a great blue heron because they're like, they just kind of flop along and they're steady flyers and they're not. Practice on those. A seagull, they're, they're right there in your face. Yeah. Practice with that. And with those become sharp, you're happy with that and following them along, then you can work on faster subjects or smaller subjects. And, and of course, people try to get these subjects and they're not very full in the frame. They're like a tiny dot. And I said, 
yeah, you're, you're making the camera work very hard. You, 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 sometimes, you know, you got to teach people when not to take the shot. Yeah. That's sometimes the hardest thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's like, but I want to, but I said, take it. I said, so we take it and then we go back and we go in through the critique and I said, yeah, that'll be dumb. But, you know, you learn that. I, I understand. That's all in the learning process. Now, Canon has more settings than the Nikons do. Um, now, I don't know about the new Nikon, the mirrorless, the Z6 and Z7s. Um, I, I haven't favored them yet for their autofocus in the action photography mode. For everything else, they seem to be fine. Um, I'm just not hearing very good things about their their birds and flight, their action stuff. Oh, but, interesting. Yeah, um, not particularly great. So we'll wait. Um, so the thing is, is it's a lot of it is that you need to, uh, the Canon gets into a whole lot of other settings, which I think I just set them all up in the middle for people when we're learning, especially okay. if they're just starting out. I said, don't get carried away with that. So everybody, everything in the middle and practice your panning and go out to the beach or go to a pond or, you know, and, uh -huh. and okay. practice. Now, now what's your, um, oh, let's talk about the shutter speed though. So we're, if we're talking about birds in flight, all right. So you think the great blue heron might be a good beginner bird in flight, huh? <laughs> Very good beginner bird. It's big, they tend to be not too shy. Um, they're good practice birds. They're slowish. I mean, you could probably get one at 500th of a second or 800th of a second, be fine. You're not talking about it's easy panning to teach your pan, uh, learn your panning techniques. And, but I, uh, I really, if, if people have not, a lot of it is what is your panning technique? If you're in the beginning, I always set in a fudge factor. And I always say have at least two thousandths of a second. Okay. Start with that. With average subjects, these are seagulls. Um, you go out at um, uh, black crowned night heron flying, um, those type things, um, egrets, um, two thousandths of a second. Then, as you get to learn your your camera and your own reactions, well, you might be able to get away with 1600th of a second or maybe 1250th of a second. But I would say, because I also like people to succeed, because succeeding at first gives you kind of get a smile on your face and you say, yeah, I did this. Yeah, so yeah. I, I like to give them success. Well, we all like to have success out when you're first getting started. So we all start out a little high. I said, well, then work from there said, you know, it all depends. And there's some lighting conditions or the day you just can't get any flight shots. And you got to say, I won't get any flight shots now because there's just not enough light. There again, you learn, you know, flight shots need light. You need the shutter speed, period. Um, and to work with any kind of with your exposure and noise, a noisy blurred picture is will be in the recycle bin very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> to get the most out of a, a, a image, it, it's got to be at least sharp. Now, how do you focus on the eye? Everybody says you need to focus on the eye. How do you do that when a bird is flying? Well, to be honest with you, unless you've got a great blue heron or you have a pretty full in the frame subject, I always build in ap enough aperture to give me a bit of fudge factor okay. with bird in flight. So therefore, that's where when pe some people start out doing their lenses that are five, six, and you start at five, six, and that's fine, except depending on where the bird's head, how big the bird is, is the bird flying towards you at an angle? If you've got the big body you're focused on, the head's not gonna be in the plane of focus. So, I always start people off with either, either a 7-1 aperture or an F8 aperture for birds in flight. It gives you 
especially for practicing in the beginning. Now, five, six is still pretty. The more telephoto your lens is, the thinner your depth of field, no matter what. Mm -hmm. So if you're working with the 600 millimeter lens, you've got a very thin depth of field. So you better have your, your focus point right on that face. <laughs> Or if you're on the body, you might not have it all in focus. It'd be out of the plane of focus. So I, I don't know. I, I tend to be, rarely do I do birds in flight less than maybe 6'3". Um, but a lot of times, especially if it's going to be full in the frame, you better have it on F8, maybe. Because the more the subjects in the frame, so if you think of it as like a macro subject, more your subject is in the frame and you have nothing in the background, let's say sky, well, you need as much, the plane of focus needs to, so you might have to have F9 maybe, depending on how big it's gonna fill your frame. Okay. Or depending if you're trying to get a group, like two of them in flight and in the same plane of focus, uh, very difficult. That yes. sounds hard. <laughs> but that's where you have to put in your aperture. And there you would probably have to go up on your ISO because the more you go up on your aperture, the little smaller that little hole is to let light in, which means you're gonna to need to let light in or have the sensor get more light somehow. So depending on what you're, you know, if you got your aperture in F9, then you, you, you're gonna to have to bump up your, your ISO to give you enough shutter speed. Um, for the for that particular uh mm -hmm. yeah right so what about now are you a, a fan of back button focusing i do not use don't like it tried it didn't work for me how long um, did you try it for i tried it for about a month well you know the problem was with me when i started doing a lot of that back focusing or at least practicing the vr the first vrs did not engage with back focus. So at that time, you all, you had to use the back focus and the shutter to engage the VR oh. back in the day. So I suppose I was soured on it then, but nowadays that's not the case so much. So, um, no. no. And what is the benefit for, for bird photographers back? Why, why do so many bird photographers really like back button? I didn't like it either to tell you the truth, but I am also not a bird photographer, but I, 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 don't, know I, those... I, I don't know, because nowadays with being able to push your focus points around, I'm not sure. I mean, in the old days, you used to, you know, you press it down and then re rearrange your, you know, your composition and all that. But nowadays with all those focus points, you can move around. I, I don't, I don't feel the need. Yeah, I don't understand the somebody who uses it a lot might be able to fill me in. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't. what I think is it it locks the focus. Um, well, it does, but uh, much so they can let go. Pardon me. Well, but for birds in flight, that's not really going to be applicable because you, you know what I mean. Let go. Why do you you, you can't let go? Birds in flight, you gotta better be. You gotta well, you're taking the picture with your shutter, but, 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 but the, you only focus once. Yeah, but where two, if you're taking I, I the picture, two focusing. Things. I, I don't want to have to deal with two fingers. There again, the way I have mine set up is I've got the one wheel doing aperture, one wheel doing exposure comp, and one by one finger on the ISO button. So I can do all that without taking my, uh, the camera away from the, my face to look at the menu. So I don't have to be fiddling with this button here and that button, which is sort of a redundant. No, didn't work for me. But like I said, some of these things, it's like processing programs. I tell people there's a ton of processing programs out there. Just learn them. And if, they, if, if it's easy for you to get the results you like, that's all that matters. I mean, because it's like, are apples better than oranges? No, some people like oranges better than apples. They're not, it's not a right or wrong issue, I suppose, is what I'm saying. You know, what's easy for one person 
might not be easy for another person. So I says, you know, what I teach is that. And then I said, go home and practice. Now you might find a routine that you find easier. And what all counts is that you're getting the shots you like and you understand the concept. Outside from that, it's kind of, I, I don't find it, there's only a few things that are absolutely wrong or absolutely right. All, all the rest are kind of, it's like my bolognese sauce. Some people like mushrooms, some people don't. Some people like green peppers, some people don't. <laughs> That's sort of how I kind of, I, I try to make photography fun and relatively easy instead of when you start talking a lot of this stuff people you, you can see their eyes they get glazed <laughs> they go oh my god you know you know and not everybody uh because i have a few cl clients that are engineers and we really get into the weeds with like lightroom and things like that and they love it and that all works but most people are not like that they like to you know they like to go out and have fun with their photography and get nice shots and don't have to go through like dreads to get them. So I, I just try to make it easy and try to make them think that if somebody does it that way and they get the shot, doesn't mean that you, you have to do it that way. Right, everybody's different. Everybody has a different technique. Everybody yeah. has a different technique. Now, when you're on a tripod, do you, you're using a gimbal head? I do, well, I, I carry around two, two items. I, I rarely use a tripod actually. Okay. Uh, so, but I do you, I have a, um, a ball head and I use a gimbal head. Um, when I'm out in South Texas, like I'm going to be at the end of uh, September, I'm going to be on some of their ranches and we're going to be in blinds. So I'll have a tripod and I'll have my gimbal head. Um, but more Is often than not, unless I'm in front of like a stationary subject that's going to be there like a nest or some situation that we're going to just hang out. I tend to do all my hand holding. Okay. For the most. So, so that's actually, you know, your advice about the different, you know, many focus points for a camera, but also a camera that's got a good, um, you know, high ISO that doesn't isn't too noisy. I think that might be another. Yes, and uh, the, the sensors have improved greatly. I mean, over time. Um, so even the, the, the only camera I can say, and unfortunately for the poor Canon people, uh, Canon is not upgrading it, which is their 7D, which is actually a wonderful camera, but their sensor is not, the Canon people might get mad at me, but I think most of them freely come up and freely admit to me, they love the camera, but not the sensor. And it's too bad that Canon didn't put a nice sensor in the really great camera body, but they didn't want to do that. So we've got a what 90D, which they've kind of composited between the 80D and the, I don't know. Well, I think they're putting their money into their mirrorless at this point, they are. you know? They are. Now, what about, um, oh crap. I just had a question that flitted in and out of my mind. I hate when that happens. <laughs> so I was talking about, oh, sensor. So would a full frame camera be better because the sensor is bigger? It, a full frame camera will always be better with higher ISOs, without a doubt. Some better than others, but definitely will be better than a crop sensor or a micro, what is it? A micro four thirds, four thirds, yes. I yeah. like that four thirds, yes. Fuji and the Olympus models are those. Those are much smaller sensors. Yeah. You just have to appreciate, you, you have decreased weight, which I know a few people that love that, but you yeah. must understand the concept. You're working with a very small sensor, which has its pros and cons. And right. one of the cons being it's prone to noise. So you just have to understand that concept. So yes, the larger, but the larger sensor cameras always will cost more money, blah, blah, blah. So, we get back to that kind of thing. Um, now, but I have one, uh, one of each. Uh, okay. So I have the D500 uh, Nikon, which is a crop sensor, which I love. I think it's probably the best uh, DSLR DX uh, camera out there, period. 
bar none. And when you say DX, you mean crop because crop sensor. That's a that's a nice one. Five crop, yes, correct. Like the seven D for Canon was a crop sensor. Right. It's got a one point six crop factor. Uh, and then I have my D eight fifty, which is the full frame um, camera, which is awesome. Uh, I fully believe that is the pet. I'm going to sound bad and they're going to boo me, but I feel the D850 for all it can do is probably the best full frame DSL, DSLR out there, uh, bar, bar none. Um, I'll probably get a few kind of boos and hisses out of that. Well, I but, just to remember when it came out, you couldn't get them. They were all back ordered because everybody wanted one. <laughs> And they're still very popular. A lot of I will not jump from my D850, even when I feel Nikon has a decent mirrorless. I will try it, but I'll try it with the idea of not using the D500 before giving up my D850. They're going to have to prove to me. I mean, I know. I mean, people getting back to this tracking thing with this eye tracking. You know, all this is great but it I still comes down to the fact of your technique and practice. Okay. You still need to know the fundamentals to get the most out of whatever computer, which is these end up to be computers exactly. at the end of the day. And yes, the mirrorless would be lighter than this D850, but this D850 got me through Brazil and the Pantanal and unbelievable ISOs and they're going to have to show me some, and I sure, I would love something half its weight. I know. <laughs> I got it. I got it. But for the time being, um, you, are we'll one, you are one macho woman, Nancy, that big old camera and big old lens. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that these smaller lenses, and you know, the smaller lenses are fine, but like Canon just came out with their, what is it, a 600 and 800 F11? Oh yeah, um, that's an odd, isn't that odd? I'm sorry. And mind you, the F4 is this, yeah. and I got you. It's 6.8 pounds. I know it's heavy and it's got awful price. I got that. But there is nothing, nothing will take away the amount of light and everything that you can get from an F4 lens against an F11. And that's F4, what size? 500. 500. 500. Mm -hmm. So, okay. um, I, I don't know why Canon came up with it. People said, well, they'd be starting out doing those for starting wildlife photographers. I said, you take it into some of the situations I'm in. At F11, you'd better be able to get an ISO up to God knows what. Stream. Yeah, I know everybody's And there's better speed out of it. Everybody's so, talking about that lens. It's such a strange I, lens. I don't understand. But now the compromise is, okay, you don't want to spend 12000 on a 500 F4 or 600. I got that. I mean, I appreciate the fact that. But Nikon came out with this. Now, this is a 500 lens, only it's 5.6. So just for our podcast listeners who can't see what you're doing, she's holding up a different lens and it's a, what did you say? 500, 500, 500, 500, so I have the 500 with the 500 millimeter lens, five, six PF. And it's not as, it's not as big and heavy as oh, the other one. Just three pounds. It's half the weight of the F4. Okay. So, and that's a little over 3000. So, I still understand the cost of these things, but F11, I, I find it useless. And I, I don't know, uh, I was recently looking at a, um, a webinar on them and they're very light and they're not much money. I, I think the 600 was, F11 was like $600 and the 800 F11 was $900, but why do I want an F11 lens for wildlife? Yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, I don't understand. Very controversial. It. Yeah. All right. Have you? All right. Let, let me just talk about. I can't believe how fast the time is going. 
Let me ask you about processing. Now, are you, um, have you ever tried that Topaz AI noise or noise AI? Topaz noise is the bomb. The bomb. <laughs> the bomb. I must say that um, I still use, uh, one of my favorite program plugins is called Nick Plugins. It, it got, it went, it's gone through a lot of permutations and companies buying them out, but short story, Long story short, there's a French company that own, owns them now called DxO. Right. I think it's the best plugin set there is. Um, it makes Photoshop or Lightroom editing selectively extremely easy. And that's one thing I try to tell the people. The software, I don't really care what software you learn, but if you don't learn how to do and edit selectively, you haven't totally learned editing. You can't just do things globally and say you know how to edit because you can't apply noise to one side and then apply it to the subject because you totally smudge the subject. You have to understand Lightroom, you can do it. I find it to be a little bit more clumsy than the Nick and Photoshop, but the brushes within Lightroom, the brushes within Photoshop Raw. I don't know much about uh, Capture One or there's a few other out there, but all of them, I'm sure within them, you, you can learn how to do that uh, edit selectively. But that's one thing that everybody's got to learn how to do selectively. So um, yes, so I do use the noise. I, I, it's algorithms uh, are amazing. Yeah. Well, did, are you using the newest one, the AI? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cause I, it, it, the other one was okay. But this is like awesome. But this noise AI with Topaz is unbelievable. And believe it or not, even though it has a way of doing things selectively, so you could just do it to one and the I just let it roll. And I find it decre it doesn't, I don't know how it does it at it all, sharpen, but it yeah. sharpens it without giving, I tend to bring down the slider some. Uh -huh. I, I, all these programs, I, 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 I tend to use the sliders down on its low point. but. It's amazing to me. And I do the Topaz first. I, 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 my raw processor is the Nikon program. I use the NXD Nikon program okay. uh, for my raw processor. I don't spend and that's, much time. And that's free, right? With your Nikon? That's free. The Canon has one. Sony has one. Olympic, free. It's free. Yeah. And I, I don't know the Nikon one very well, but I, the Canon one, I fought. I didn't want to learn Lightroom because I was so happy with the Canon software and it was free. Yes, yeah, so I I like it because I have my camera set up. A little secret I'll tell you. All these cameras have picture profiles or these, mm -hmm. I, they have different names for them. Now, people say, oh, that's for the JPEG. I got that, except for the fact the histogram you view out in the field to get your pictures rightly exposed is using the JPEG image, not your raw image. So what I do is I go into the color profiles or picture profiles, how, whatever your camera model calls it. And you should go into it that you can even go into it, the contrast, the sharpness. I turn down the contrast. So I try to fake out the histogram to look like a raw, the oh, raw histogram. Because okay. the thing is, if you look at the exposure with a JPEG, it's very contrasty. And you won't get the most out of those whites or those blacks. Whereas now, if you do that with your contrast, now when you look and you view at your pic your pictures in the back of your camera, you're going to say they, well, they look a little blah or like. Don't worry about that. You can do all that in post. Easy done in post. But that will help you expose, give you a little more exposure and a little more room on the whites and the blacks okay. to get exposure out. So that's, that's just something you do one time and you don't have to think that's about a one time that. thing and that's it. So you just so then when I bring it into to post now with the Nikon program, I it it gives me exactly what I had in the camera. Now, if you bring it into an Adobe program, now people tell me now, and I have played with it, that they don't interpret it with the Adobe, that they'll interpret it. You make a little selection that it's supposed to interpret it with the Nikon selection, that you pick your Nikon camera and everything. I don't know. 
I like the Nikon program. It shows me what I've done. It shows me my little focus points. So if something has gone wrong, I know exactly whether it was operator or error or did yeah. I have not the focus points in the wrong place. I do the little exposure, a little shadow, and then I come out of that program as a TIFF, a 16-bit TIFF. Okay. And then I take that into Photoshop. Okay. TIFF, a TIFF and a raw image are lossless files, which means you can edit, save, edit, save, edit, save, and never lose information. Yeah. JPEG, you edit, save, edit, save, and each time you do that, you're losing a little bit of information. I have um, a picture that I, in my class, the four weeks to proficiency class I was talking about, and I just took a picture and I opened it and closed it, opened it and closed it in Photoshop. Like, I don't know, probably, probably did it like 40 or 50 times, but it just completely started deteriorating. Oh, so exactly. I show that in the class, you know, you gotta be careful. That's a good, good example. So I save it as a 16-bit TIFF, and then I take it into Photoshop to do my finishing. So I use the Photoshop with the Nick filters and the Topaz. Okay. But the first thing I do when I take it into Photoshop is I, if I'm gonna use Topaz, that's my first step. Yeah, that, that stuff is, I just got it. I, I didn't have it. I just got oh, it. No, it's, I it's, can't believe how good this stuff is. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to, I have to believe it's, I, I, I don't know how, but it's, it's, they got that right. It's that, the bomb. Program right. it's the bomb. <laughs> <laughs> now we, we need to wrap up. I cannot believe how fast this went. So, um, Top five tips for birds in flight. Sorry? Top, what are your top five tips for birds in flight? Top five, I'm gonna say actually all five are the same. Shutter speed, shutter speed, shutter speed, shutter speed, and shutter speed. I say that because nine times out of 10, most people don't have enough shutter speed. Um, it's hard um, to say that though, because what I got from this one hour interview was the Practice panning, practice panning. I heard you say well, that many, many times. Yes, practice, practice, shutter speed, shutter speed. Um, yeah, because all of the others are variables of which you have to put in and understand the situation and that those all change, but shutter speed doesn't change and the practice you're planning doesn't change. Okay, I love it, I love it. I You do, I agree. It's funny when I'm teaching, you know, I teach, mostly beginners and uh i just i just drill that whole shutter speed because it is so hard you yes, said well, 99 percent so of your bad pictures are probably because your shutter speed was too it slow and so you have to pay attention to that to iso and i said don't be afraid of that iso deal with that later if they're not sharp or not exposed right they're all going in the bin exactly so well nancy and what's oh tell us your website Oh, yes. And please, everybody, uh, my website is naturesportal.net. I'm in Florida. I do one-on-one -on -one, uh, personal workshops. I do Zoom. And you're near uh, Orlando, uh, right? Near Orlando, yes. I do one-on-one -on -one and group Zoom workshops, uh, personal workshops, and I have some great trips coming up. Uh, Costa Rica next year, and I've got um, Texas and the ranches and Galapagos and possibly uh, Costa Rica again for 2022. So uh, please, I'm on Facebook, say hello. I, I'm here to help. Yeah, and I, I, it's a really good idea to follow Nancy on Facebook because she posts a lot of really, really good stuff. It's fun, it's fun, it's fun to watch her. <laughs> Let's all make it fun, exactly. So I am going to put that in the show notes on understandphotography.com. I'm going to put the links, uh, naturesportal.net. Oh, that, yes. And that's Nancy Elwood's website. Thank you for being on the Understand Photography Show. Thank you so much. It was great fun. Appreciate it, Peggy. www.naturesportal.net is Nancy's website. But of course, go to our website at understandphotography.com for the show notes, and I'll have links to her. Nancy's site and her Facebook page. But while you're on our site, be sure to click on the, you know, click here for freebies and, you know, choose whatever you'd like to download or watch a video or whatever. And then you'll be put on our mailing list. I do put out a newsletter once a month and it's got photo tips and then what we've got going on in Understand Photography as well.
I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you so much for joining us on the Understand Photography Show. We will see you in two weeks. Get up.